Good morning and welcome to Grand Rounds and welcome to everybody streaming live uh, out in the uh, universe as well. Uh, I'm Kaz Nelson, I'm Vice Chair for Education for the University of Minnesota Department of Psychiatry and the, today is one of my favorite Grand Rounds of the year because it's a chance for our third year resident class to work together and they put effort in over the course of the year to design and implement a quality improvement project uh, in order to enhance the care that we offer our patients. And so you'll be hearing from Drs. Ali Autry, Marianne Bernardino, Travis Ferencamp, Claire Garber, Kelsey Pouts, Vince Valera, and Laura Wixter, who is an exceptional group of residents that I'm thrilled to introduce to you, and I know they're going to do a wonderful job. And they developed um, a truly an innovative project, uh, and I'll just share with you that um, from time to time, in the third year class, we say, well, there's an assignment where you have to do a project. Sometimes there's groaning and grumbling and feeling like it's uh, maybe an extra responsibility that they have to do and kind of have to scramble to come up with an idea that they like. This class has been developing this project even prior to this and are really passionate and have their heart into it. And this was really probably something they would be doing anyways, even outside of an assignment. So I think it's extra exciting for them to be able to share this with you today because it's been the culmination of a couple of years of hard work. That's um, and elements of this have been presented nationally as well. So I'll turn it over to you at this point. Welcome, everybody. Okay, well, welcome, and thank you, Dr. Nelson, for that introduction. So we're going to be talking to you today about a patient continuity conference that we developed and implemented over the past year. We have no financial relationships to disclose, and we will not be discussing off-label use of medications. Uh, so at the conclusion of today's grand rounds, we hope that you will understand the motivation for implementing this conference, and um, you'll gain exposure to the format and the structure of the conference, and you'll be able to appreciate the educational benefits for residents. So again, I'm Dr. Bernardino, and I'll be leading you through the introduction and the history behind this project. Dr. Garber will be reviewing the literature. Dr. Fahrenkamp will be giving you an overview of the cases that were presented throughout the year. Dr. Powitz will present our results, and Dr. Wixer will lead us through a discussion on our findings as well as future directions. So this picture was taken on our first day of PGY3 year. We were the first class that had the unique opportunity to mark the transition from the inpatient to the outpatient clinic by having a retreat day during which we were able to reflect on our experiences as learners um, up until that point. And we also spent a fair amount of time thinking about how we wanted to make the most of the second half of our residency training. And the reason I wanted to share this picture with you today is because I think it illustrates the strong sense of camaraderie we have in our class. And it's in this spirit that this quality improvement project originated. And I should mention, I'm, I'm really thrilled that the retreat tradition is continuing today as um, the incoming PGY3s are on their retreat day. So the background and history of this project. In order to help you better understand the origins of this project, I need to take you back to the fall of 2014. We were newly minted PGY2s trying to figure out call schedules, how to operate more independently while on night float, and how to give each other solid handoffs for safe patient care. We were all excited and nervous um, to face these new responsibilities. Around this time, my husband, who many of you know is a gastroenterologist, came home and told me at their section meetings, they were expected to open the meeting with a reflection on one of the organization's core values. Now, as the newly appointed section chair of his department, he wasn't terribly excited about this because he felt like it wasn't going to feel, um, there wasn't going to be a way to do that that felt authentic to him. And I thought about it a little bit, and I said, well, why don't you, you know, you don't have to read a poem. Why not just highlight a clinical experience that um, illustrates your values in action? And he liked that idea, and I liked my idea. <laughs> and in fact, I liked it so much that I wanted to implement that type of conversation amongst my own colleagues. So with the help of Brian Kuhn, the current chief resident at the time, we gathered the PGY 1s and 2s and had a conversation about what would it look like if we adopted a set of values as a group 
and work to put them into action. And the hope was that by doing this, we would protect the values that had originally drawn us into healthcare and also protect ourselves from burnout. The group was very enthusiastic. This was an easy, easy sale. Everyone was nodding their heads. I thought I was gonna have to convince people, but everyone wanted to do it. And over the course of that year, we identified the values of integrity, compassion, leadership, advocacy, and teamwork. The conversations in this group often focused around ideals pertaining to resident cohesion, patient safety, and teamwork. There was a lot of energy about how we might foster these ideals in our program. And it seemed the best way to address all of these things would be to create a space where we could talk about the patients we had in common and how we could best serve them. Our hope was that this would decrease some of the sense of isolation and disconnect that we had felt as junior residents in regards to our relationships with the senior residents. And we thought that if we could address this isolation that junior residents might feel less intimidating approaching senior residents. We wanted this to be a venue that would increase the exchange of knowledge between training levels, as well as facilitate improved communication related to patient care. We also hoped that this would be a place where we could start introducing junior residents to outpatient care in order to help demystify the clinic and ease the transition from the inpatient to the outpatient service. And we were really thrilled and really excited that we had landed on a quality improvement project that came out of the values that were important to us. Finally, as we sat and listened to last year's QI project um, that, that last year's class did on burnout in the clinic, we recall that one of the factors associated with burnout is isolation. And we hope that if this conference could decrease isolation and increase resident cohesion, that it would be protective against burnout. So as we took all of those thoughts, gathered our thoughts, we sat down and began to conceptualize the project further. And we came up with these three goals. First, we wanted to increase our understanding of how the transition of care from the inpatient to the outpatient setting impacts patients and how we could facilitate smooth transitions of care. Second, we wanted to improve communication between the inpatient and outpatient settings. We recognize that although interns are generally charged with the task of writing discharge summaries, they have almost no formal instruction on how to do that. Given the importance of this communication tool, we wanted to make sure interns felt prepared for how to write effective discharge summaries. We also wanted to encourage increased communication between residents during a patient's hospitalization. Finally, we wanted to increase cohesion amongst all of the resident classes. We hope that by providing a setting to talk about shared patients, that we would all get to know each other better and have an opportunity to exchange knowledge between the classes. So our methods, the structure of the conference morphed over the course of the year based on the feedback from the participants. And um, some of my colleagues will be talking later, later about how we ended up um, shaping the conference. But initially we had planned to do a conference about every other month. We imagined we would present several cases at each conference and would give a very brief overview of the patient's presentation, hospital course, and post-hospital updates. We decided to hold these conferences on Thursdays at noon, and that time was selected because the PGY1 class already had time set aside at that time, so it wasn't going to add to their overall conference burden. And um, although it was an additional noon conference for the rest of the classes, however, participation was voluntary. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Gerber. All right, so as we were developing this project, um, wanted to look through the literature and see what we could find. Were there similar projects that had been done or things that helped kind of support um, our motivations, our goals, um, and see if we could learn from that? So um, as Marianne mentioned, one of our goals really was to try to focus on this transition time between an inpatient hospitalization and then the outpatient um, follow-up and how we could kind of better understand this time, communicate um, effectively, and just overall, you know, have this be a smooth um, transition. So one of the papers I found that I felt really kind of highlighted why this was important was a, um, it was a primary care residency group and at a large academic center. And basically what they looked at is they compared the resident 
um, clinic patients to the faculty clinic patients um, through this transition. And what they found was that the resident patients had longer periods of time uh, to post-hospitalization follow-up in the clinic, higher rates of readmission, and they were less likely to see their own provider at follow-up. Um, and so it felt like this really highlighted um, for us why this is a vulnerable time for our patients, specifically in a resident clinic, and um, kind of supported um, our desire to really focus on this um, clinical time for patients. Um, another thing Marianne mentioned was kind of this idea about stress and burnout and, you know, as she mentioned, last year's PGY class kind of focused on this for their QI project. And, you know, um, I'm not going to talk exactly about burnout, but, um, but it was kind of a ever present in our minds um, as we we're developing this as something we really wanted to prevent in ourselves and um, be able to recognize and address. Um, and so, you know, in the literature, we know that stress and burnout is very common um, during residency training, very well documented. And so I, I picked out this paper to highlight for you guys, which was a, um, an internal medicine residency group. And um, basically what they did was they created these support groups for the residents to participate in um, throughout a couple years of their, pro of their training and really focus on kind of, you know, professional development struggles, you know, their professional identity as a resident, how to support each other, how to talk through concerns, things like that. Um, but what I thought was kind of, you know, one of their findings that I thought was pretty important was that the residents overwhelmingly pointed to their peer relationships as the most critical source of support um, through their training in really addressing and preventing burnout. And so kind of gets back to one of our goals, which is really how do we, um, you know, increase resident cohesion among all of our class or all of the classes in order to be able to support each other and in, um, in this kind of um, goal of preventing um, burnout. Um, so in my search for other projects, as you can imagine, you know, I didn't, there wasn't anything really kind of that jumped out as um, exactly the same as what we were doing or developing or even that similar, but I'm going to talk about two um, projects that were done, again, in internal medicine residency programs, where they focused on kind of just developing a curriculum to teach interns how to write discharge summaries. And like Marianne mentioned, um, you know, it's often the intern right at the beginning of training that's, you know, in charge of writing this really important communication tool um, with really little to no instruction on exactly what's important and um, what should be included. And again, you know, as junior residents, we've never worked in the outpatient clinic. We don't know what an outpatient doctor wants to see or um, know, you know, from a discharge summary. And so it's kind of this, um, you know, this really important tool that um, you're not really trained well on how to write right away. So. These, like I mentioned, these are two um, internal medicine residency programs that kind of developed specific curriculums around this. One of the programs put all the residents in the curriculum. The other paper actually randomized their residents. Some residents got this curriculum, some did not. Um, and what they were able to show in both the papers is really that they improved their quality and reliability of their discharge summaries following kind of specific instruction. So this was another kind of motivator for us um, in developing this conference is that we wanted to spend time, especially in the beginning, really focusing on how do you write an effective discharge summary. Um, last, I'm going to talk about this kind of idea as um, resident as the educator model, and this originated in Van from Vanderbilt in 2008, um, but this particular paper um, was a surgery residency program um, that was using this kind of um, you know, resident as the educator model to design their didactic programs. And, um, and their goals were really, you know, kind of promoting this culture of resident, of education and residency, um, having kind of a resident as the, um, as the educator and the, um, and the lecturer really allows the resident to kind of master the topic being presented. And um, they felt like residents, um, you know, teaching, were closer in age and experience to their peers and allowed for kind of an easier um, exchange of knowledge um, because of that. 
Um, they felt like this helped residents really feel invested in um, their quality of their education for the purpose of kind of patient safety, knowing that their team really was on top of things and knew what they needed to know. And then, you know, really promoting kind of the professional development of residents as educators. Um, so we felt like this was, you know, while there are a few opportunities in our training in which we get to educate our peers, it's not a big um, it's not a big focus, and so this was another opportunity where we felt like we could really um, be able to exchange knowledge kind of between all the classes and, um, you know, as third years kind of take on our, you know, write our own learning objectives from cases, pick out interesting things, and really have the opportunity to kind of be educators for our peers. So next I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Fahrenkamp, and he is going to give you kind of a taste of some of the cases we talked through, and um, you can see what the conferences were like. Thank you. So we started with the pilot session in the spring uh, prior to starting our third year. We discussed a 41-year-old female with borderline personality disorder and treatment-resistant depression. Clear objectives were not quite identified at that time, though the topics did include a presentation of the hospital course, discussion of treatments for refractory depression, and then highlighting coordination of care between inpatient and outpatient teams. Feedback was overwhelmingly positive at the time, and thus this reinforced the idea to move forward with starting a conference for our quality improvement project. In our first actual session, we presented one case, a 31-year-old Somali female with first episode mania. This session had a focus on developing expectations for effective communication. We used an example of a discharge summary from our inpatient team in order to reflect on information that was desired by outpatient providers in the clinic setting. Objectives included fostering collaboration with inpatient and outpatient providers, discussing appropriate means of communication, uh, outlining goals for effective communication, discovering key points about provider handoffs, and again, tips, tips on writing effective discharge summaries. During session two, we tried reviewing two cases with the objectives noted here. We had an opportunity to start discussing more aspects of clinical care in the outpatient setting, offering our limited wisdom based on our first few months of experience. We specifically focused on assessment of safety while also introducing the process of admitting a patient from the clinic. We then transitioned to a focus on how to collaborate with, with other family members and care providers that worked with the patient, enhancing post-discharge care, and we reviewed the key points about completing releases of information. For session three, based on feedback, we cut back to presenting one case at a time. We began to incorporate more outpatient practice pearls and started adding more medication-specific topics, here with a focus on clozapine use. For this patient in particular, a Somali female with schizophrenia under commitment in Jarvis, who uh, had some decompensation in the context of, of medication non-adherence, uh, object objectives included understanding the cultural context of this patient's experience, uh, reviewing resources and effective use of interpreter services, as well as sharing opportunities for involvement of family in, in discharge planning. With the use of clozapine, we discussed differences and proposed challenges to monitoring, highlighted the much appreciated pharmacy resources that are available in our clinic, the clozapine REMS guidelines, as well as effective use of the EMR for ordering and monitoring clozapine. In session four, we added more medication-specific pearls and actually started teaching more of the skills that we had learned in clinic. Based on feedback, we also began to involve other residents. With this case in particular, we started by having the PGY-1 present their experience working with this patient during the rotation in the emergency department. They reviewed and presented their emergency department note, including the physical exam, while the rest of the group was led to identify and review signs and symptoms of serotonin syndrome. This was followed by a review of the hospital course provided by the PGY-2. And finally, the PGY-3 reviewed the remaining outpatient course of treatment and reflected on considerations for complex treatment plans in addition to introducing techniques from Dr. Bass regarding medication cross-titrations. In session five, we highlighted clinical monitoring tools with a focus on labs, abnormal movement scales, and how to optimize the use of epic smart phrases and flow sheets. We presented a 27-year-old male with schizoaffective disorder who had an extended hospital stay after several readmissions. And objectives included a review of management and monitoring of lithium and neuroleptics, providing a refresher on smart phrases, which were highlighted not only as a note enhancement tool, but also as an on-point reference to be used during clinic, clinic visits. On a side note, following this session, everybody was gifted a laminated table of lab monitoring guidelines courtesy of Dr. Pouts. <laughs> we then reviewed the utility of the AIMS, how to administer it, and how to record the numeric results in EPIC flow sheets. 
We then circled back to topics discussed in previous sessions, including a review of the admission process from clinic and effective handoffs between inpatient and outpatient providers. This case in session six, an 18-year-old female with active suicidal ideation and worsening depression, was also presented with collaboration from the PGY-1 that cared for the patient on the unit. We discussed treatment and management of impulsivity in the outpatient setting, management of chronically suicidal patients in clinic, as well as, a, as, well as teaching the new clinic protocol for discharges, including components of care coordination that are provided by the nurses, meetings with supervisors, and key points about billing. We also introduced the shiny new safety plan smart phrase that was developed by Dr. Autry and Dr. Bernardino, which highlights risk and protective factors to look for when assessing safety and offers a templated safety plan that can actually be used and printed for patients in the after-visit summary. Session 7 concluded our series with a 39-year-old male with severe major depression that experienced an adverse event. Initial was focused on processing this event with co-residents, followed by a discussion about various approaches to reaching out to patients and families. We reviewed the legal resources available to us as residents in this program, and then we shifted focus to learning points about medication interactions with a demonstration of how to access clinical resources, specifically micromedics and up-to-date, which are oftentimes used by us in the clinic. I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Pouts, who's going to discuss our results. Thank you. So again, the first pilot conference was in April 2015, and just as a reminder, this did not include the current PGY-1 class. Uh, we opted to have a formal survey after this conference, uh, with the PGY-1 and 2s receiving a slightly different survey from the PGY-3 and 4s. I'm not going to go into the specifics uh, of the data that we obtained from this, given it's the pilot, and I'd really like to focus on some of the results we obtained later on. But um, the survey did reveal an overall increase in the knowledge of inpatient and outpatient uh, care among all classes, and overall the feedback from the conference was positive. The first conference that we had with the current PGY 1 through 4 classes was in July of 2015, as we reviewed. Again, this, was, this took place after reviewing a discharge summary completed for a clinic patient and discussing the challenges and the complexities of writing a discharge summary. Um, and after we discussed this with the PGY 1s, we decided we'd focus more on this instead of the specific clinical care. Um, in our beginning attempt to get feedback, we opted again to implement a formal survey, again giving the PGY-1 and 2s a slightly different uh, survey version than the PGY-3 and 4s. Uh, the PGY-1 and 2s were asked after the conference how their knowledge of what to include in a discharge summary changed after the conference. The options they had to choose from on the rating scale included zero, meaning it did not change, up to a four, representing significantly increased. Uh, the specific results are noted, and the average was a 2.7, with that two score of 2 meeting increased somewhat. The next few questions were asked to all residents, classes 1 through 4, who were in attendance. We asked them to assess their knowledge of inpatient management, that, how it was affected by the conference. The scale, again, was 0, meaning unchanged through 4, which represented increased significantly. Uh, the 1 and 2s had an average rating of 1.6, and the PGY 3 and 4s were similar with 1.7. As a reminder, the 2 corresponded with somewhat increased. In the same way, we asked all residents to assess how their knowledge of outpatient care was affected by the conference. Uh, this, again, was the same scale, 0 to 4, meaning not, not changed up to increased significantly. Uh, the PGY 1 and 2s had an average of 1.3, and the PGY 3 and 4s of 1.6. And then lastly, we asked all residents to assess how their ability to communicate with each other was affected by the conference. All classes did report an improvement in their knowledge of how to communicate uh, with each other. The average rating for both groups was about a 2, corresponding with increased somewhat. So as you can see from this feedback, there was some perceived benefit from the conference, but it was not robust. Uh, we realized we did need to take a step back and review the goals and the objectives that we have for the conference and see if we could modify things to better serve the residents. So our next conference was in October. As I, noticed, as I noted, we recognized that the conference uh, was a work in progress and we uh, worked to make changes. We realized that while a formal survey was useful in helping us gauge if there are perceived benefits from this conference, um, 
It did not give us direction on how we might move to improve it, so we opted to implement a post-conference discussion to allow us to get feedback on what worked and what might be a better approach to take. Um, from this, we learned that there, well, there was a positive reception to having specific learning objectives. There is an appreciation that the clinic process was beginning to be demystified and it didn't seem to be felt that it was information too far from being applicable to the junior residents. Uh, the conference itself was found to be a venue that allowed for um, improving communication among the inpatient and the outpatient teams. It allowed for discussions of expectations regarding how to approach another resident. It provided familiarity with each other, and it made it easier to approach each other. We were also able to learn what we could do better. Uh, it included narrowing the focus of the discussion to high-yield aspects, including medical decision-making and treatment planning, in return eliminating some of the less pertinent background information about a case. It was suggested that this might allow more cases to be presented um, and increase the variety of topics that were included in each conference, but there were mixed reviews on having one more, more than one case as some of the residents noted that the conference did seem rushed. Um, we were able to see that there was some tardiness related to everybody needing to get lunch um, and so that might have contributed in part to the conference seeming a little bit rushed, and we realized that we might be able to help this if we provided food. Uh, the last, and lastly, several of the interns actually asked to have the conference at least monthly, if not more often. So we implemented this feedback for the next two conferences, and then collected feedback again in December. Uh, this was done primarily through written feedback, including presenting one specific question that residents were asked to pick a rated response to and then we were able to break this feedback down by class. Recommendations that we received from the PGY1s that stood out was their feeling that the conference was enhanced when the admitting resident, the inpatient resident, and the outpatient resident were all included in the presentation, um, and that they really wanted this to carry into each conference. They also noted that focusing on more of complex cases and cases that were more recent were also preferred. Uh, they mentioned some highlights were that we were making sure to include some protocol and system issues that were often not addressed otherwise. They liked the conversational tone of the conference, the mixing of the resident classes, and the educational benefits of having the inpatient and the outpatient care discussed together. The PGY2s also identified some highlights. Uh, they noted that the, we had modified the conference to contain the right amount of content and that we were choosing relevant content that we were presenting in a well-organized way. Uh, they had appreciation that we were including the targeted learning objectives and that we were also including some reviews of the literature. Uh, they also enjoyed that we were really trying to include several domains of care that were involved with each case. We as PGY3s also gave feedback because we all had different views on how each conference should be done. Uh, we noted that one thing done well was kind of in line with what the PGY2s had said and that that being the incorporation of research-based um, pharmacological treatment as it applied to a case. Uh, we noted strengths including taking time to address safety issues, providing a supportive environment for processing cases, as again, uh, these were complex cases that tended to have a lot of emotion involved. And lastly, we were coming to see that having one case did seem to work a lot better. As I noted, we did pose one specific question, asking all residents to rate how they identified with the given statement, that being, I found this session beneficial. All 14 residents in attendance noted they strongly agreed with the statement. Uh, this was four PGY1s, three PGY2s, and five PGY3s. We didn't have PGY4s in attendance that day. Uh, we again asked for feedback without a formal survey at the next two conferences, which were in February and March of this year, which I'll run through just briefly. Uh, the highlights continued to include that the conference provided a venue for communication between the classes. Residents noted communication between each other was becoming more natural and routine. There continued to be an appreciation for peer teaching on topics of workflow as well as patient care specifics. And there is an interest in having the conference continued into the next academic year. Our last conference was this past April, at which time we asked residents to complete a formal survey, which included five statements, which they're asked to rate their degree, or their degree of disagreement or agreement with the given statement. We had at least 50% of each class represented, with the exception of the PGY4 class with just one resident in attendance. The first statement residents were asked to complete was, 
These conferences increase my knowledge of the transition of care from outpatient to inpatient and inpatient to outpatient. Of the 18 residents surveyed, 14 identified strong agreement with the statement, with two residents from the PGY1 uh, and two classes rating a four for agreement. The second statement we posed was, these conferences increase my confidence in my ability to communicate with the inpatient and outpatient providers, including writing a discharge summary. 12 of 18 residents noted strong agreement, with six residents noting agreement. The next statement was, these conferences increase comfort, cohesion, and exchange of knowledge in bet between the PGY classes. 15 of 18 residents noted strong agreement with this statement, um, with three residents noting agreement. We additionally asked residents to rate their identification with the statement of, I found these conferences beneficial. 16 of 18 residents noted strong agreement with one PGY1 and one PGY2 noting a four for agreement. And lastly, we asked residents to rate their identification with the statement of, I would continue to attend these conferences in the future if it was offered. The results showed that 16 of 18 residents had strong agreement with this statement and one resident from both the PGY 1 and 2 class noted a four for agreement. Taking into account the average ratings of the conference assessed by the five statements that were pre presented to the residents, the conference was received, over received overall high scores from all the classes. And that's all I have for the results, and I will hand it over next to Dr. Wixer. All right, so I'm going to take us through the discussion section. So just to go over the goals of our conference again with you, um, so better understand the continuity of care for patients between inpatient and outpatient care. Uh, uh, we had just overall agreement on that, 14 out of 18, again, strongly agreed with the statement. Um, we also were able to address some specific educational opportunities for these, for, for all of us, specifically for the PGY 1s and 2s. Um, with the logistics of clinic, having not been in clinic, it's very hard um, to have an understanding of what goes on with the patient there and the, what they go through before they get to the unit and after discharge, and so we were able to demystify clinic. Um, additionally, we were able to target some of those specific clinical pearls, so um, we talked about the use of micromedics, you know, drug-drug interactions, lab monitoring schedules, um, clinical syndromes, so the, the, this net of inpatient, outpatient care and how we take care of our patients between, uh, within the residency program, really, between clinic and the hospital, we were able to really um, understand that whole, that whole continuity of care. Our second goal was to improve communication between the residents, specifically um, this written communication with the discharge summary, as well as really how do we even just talk about our patients and how they're doing in the hospital. So um, we succeeded in this, right? So everyone agreed that we improved communication. That could be, that could be um, sending a text message. That could be, you know, sending a page when our patients get admitted. That could be writing a, a better discharge summary. Our third goal was increased cohesion among the PGY classes. We, again, we succeeded. Um, and this is a really important, this is a really important point. I just want to highlight the, the other two um, are important as well. For us, I think we, we talked about the history of our values-based project and where we were coming from with our retreat. And for us, having seen um, the burnout skills in clinic from the class before us, this was, this was almost like the core, I think, one of the core goals for us. We wanted to lower isolation. We wanted to ensure there wasn't this sense of intimidation between the senior and junior residents. Um, in our residency program, we don't actually work a ton together, honestly. Um, the ones and twos get opportunities to work together, but once you're in clinic, you're pretty distant from the junior residents. And having a sense of even just knowing who these people are, I mean, putting a face to a name, having a cell phone number that you can text or call, um, and providing this network of providers together that we can, that we call teamwork, and that was one of our core values, is teamwork. How are we gonna do this for these patients? Um, remembering that study, right, that showed that residents, at least in that one primary care clinic, got were, those, their patients had 
poor outcomes, right? So we don't want that for our patients. And if there's if one thing we can do to improve that is improve cohesion, working on teamwork, um, it's a win-win-win. Thinking back to how it felt for us um, as PGY ones and twos, you know, we did feel really disconnected and intimidated. We would go through maybe our first entire year without seeing or meeting some of the G3s and 4s. Um, it's intimidating to have these senior residents around that you don't, you don't know who they are. You've never had a chance to talk to them. Um, you don't know how, you, how they feel about how you took care of their patients on the inpatient unit. It can, it can feel really intimidating. Um, EPIC, our EMR, has a messaging system that's used widely in clinic and not really used much on the inpatient units. And we, like, showed up to clinic orientation not having even known that this existed um, as the primary mode of communication with clinic residents and then us being so disconnected from that, um, highlighting the rare communication that we have, that we have even ever had with them. And then just clinic in general is this mysterious other being that we hadn't gotten to yet. So after our conference, we really found through further patients that were admitted after various rounds of the conference and also just reports from the G1s and G2s, we saw an increase in communication. I mean, we have each other's cell phone numbers. We'd get a text, hey, I'm on call. I'm admitting your patient. Is there anything that I should know or what do you want to add? Um, uh, now we know how to use EPIC messaging, right? And we've incorporated that. So the G1s and G2s have that. So it's really easy for an admitting resident to just send a message through the EMR to their clinic, to the clinic provider. Hey, I'm admitting your patient. Let me know um, what you want to do. Better understanding of how clinic works from the G1s and G2s really helps not only um, just understand what your patient has been through, if they've had to be in the clinic, go to the ER, sit there, wait for hours, wait for admission to the unit. Um, and then vice versa, after discharge, preparing their patients better for discharge. Here's what it's going to look like. I'm going to set up an appointment for you. What does that mean? What is the, the nurse is going to call you? Um, just all the logistics of that. And now we know each other better. We know each other better. And this is, this is a really important point. Um, so the, the, but I just want to say, aside from those three core, core things, so improving inpatient to outpatient care, communication, and cohesion, um, just in general, we all really liked this conference. It was really fun. Um, it was fun. We learned a lot. We got to know each other better. And everyone said that they found it beneficial. They'd want it to continue. Um, they would certainly attend if offered. So unintended consequences to this project. The presentation of the case, um, as we said, sometimes it was pretty brief. And yet, at the same time, if a resident's presenting a case at this conference, it may have precluded um, per the resident's choice, presenting at our complex case conference, which is like our morbidity and mortality conference, and, um, at, and at other complex uh, conference venues where we present patients. Now, there are different learning objectives, right, in our continuity conference than from a complex case or an M&M conference. But at the same time, um, so a patient could certainly be presented in both places. Um, but at the same time, it, it's certainly understandable that a resident may choose to only present a case in one venue. We intentionally did not have faculty oversight in this conference. It was resident only. <clears throat> and the reason for that was because we wanted a safe place for the residents. So we wanted um, people to be able to feel vulnerable, uh, say, I don't, I don't know that. I don't know how to monitor lithium. You know, I don't know how to, what the, all the signs and symptoms are of serotonin syndrome because that's where the learning, that's, that's what enables the learning, right? And so it was intentional. However, you can see how there could be downsides to that. So. We wouldn't, not having the expertise in the room when we're talking about a clinical syndrome or a certain, you know, going over the AIMS scoring, you know, we can all imagine why it would be helpful to have faculty there um, to, just, to just aid with that, the clinical side of it. And then this is just one more thing to tack on to your day, right? So lunch hour may be your one time during the day where you have fewer obligations. And so to come and do one more thing, one more conference, as you could imagine, for the residents could certainly feel burdensome, especially if it's, a, it's been a long day thus far. So future directions that we were where this could go. This was fairly informal, as I said, right? No faculty were there. We wanted it to be a safe space. Um, we sort of presented our cases as we saw them and as we had experienced them. However, we've seen a lot of data that shows that a handoff process is better for patient care. Um, it's probably better for communication between you know, better for communication between providers and providers to feel like they've been heard regarding their own patient care. 
So it could, we could you know, go with this to create a more formalized handoff process. Handoff process. So it could be anywhere from like, you know, I had, every time a resident admits a patient, they shoot a text message to the outpatient resident's cell phone. Um, anywhere from that to a formal discharge planning meeting on the unit with the outpatient provider present. Right, so the, there are a lot of different options and, and ways that this could go in the future. Um, we chose to do this as our G3 class. We had a, a, we had motivation. We had a lot of passion about this. We also had a need to do it, right, because we need to do a QI project. And so if this were to continue, it, it's reasonable that we would need to embed it within the culture of the residency program um, to expect a G3 class to be doing all this on top of their own QI project or whatnot. Um, maybe a lot to ask, and so there may be a role for the chief resident or for other people within the program to sustain this, um, uh, to really have a motivation to sustain it within the culture. You know, food was a really big deal. It seems silly, but um, truly, when we had food, when we advertised that there was going to be food there, we had a higher turnout, um, and also people weren't as late because they weren't going to get food, right, as you can imagine. So you're rounding up, things, you're, you're finishing up, wrapping up on the unit, you're wrapping up in clinic with your patients, and then you have to still go all the way to the cafeteria or find some food and, and get there. So we, we got a lot more done when we had the ability, um, when the department was able to um, provide food or actually sometimes we even we, we made snacks at home the night before in Brunman. So it was, that, was a, that made a really big deal, um, big difference. And the other thing that, so just sort of tangential to this, is that at the same time that we were doing this conference and working on improving resident cohesion, um, the department just did this absolutely wonderful thing to support us by allowing this all resident retreat. So a day where we were excused from clinical duties to um, work on improving resident cohesion and being together and having this experience. So this occurred in the spring. Um, it was a day where even night float the night before was excused from clinical duty so they could be there. So we were all together, all four classes. Um, and this had, as you can imagine, never happened before. So I want to just share with you a picture from that day. And as a way of helping you to understand how important this was, this is a transformative experience for all of us. So this focus and emphasis on improving resident cohesion is is big to prevent burnout, but it's also big for all the other components of what we do together as a team um, and all those values that we had talked about. This is a quote from one of the residents who participated. Thanks for being such an amazing group of people to work and have fun with. I will always remember this retreat as a highlight of my residency. So um, it wasn't a part of our project, but it, and yet, um, I can't, we can't emphasize enough what a difference it made as far as creating this um, all-class cohesion. And these, are, and these are our references, but I want to leave you with this one instead. So, all right. Thank you. Thanks. So just to highlight that the efforts that you all did in the second year and in the third year were completely uh, resident-driven and uh, kind of a grassroots effort, and it kind of touched on the idea then, how do you sustain this through subsequent uh, classes? Does anybody have any ideas about that? So, you know, this was obviously part of your identity. How, you know, if, if something is done sort of independent of, of the program, so to speak, um, how to fuel that fire? Yeah, we've thought about that a lot. You know, with the values project, we were kind of hoping that that would um, continue again with the, the PGY one and two group because those classes work so intimately together. Um, and, and it didn't, and I, I think it's hard. It's, um, it's not really something that can come from above. And so that's some, a challenge that we've thought a lot about, a lot about is how do you formalize a curriculum like that so that it feels um, like something you're choosing to do. So, so we kind of let that go, and in part because we were moving on and focusing on this. With this conference, I think it would be easier to embed this in the culture of the residency because um, you could have, say, that the chief resident could help identify cases and encourage residents to present them and assuming 
um, that, that, that there's a lot of buy-in from the residents, I think it would be well accepted. And based on our experience this year, I think people would be really motivated to help identify cases to present. I think the main thing is having somebody that's coordinating, scheduling it, setting up the room, and, and I think the rest will come as long as you have someone doing that. Laura? <laughs> Our incoming chief resident has committed to do all those things. <laughs> Other questions or comments? Dr. Olson? That was a really nice presentation. <clears throat> um, I, I'd like to suggest uh, another way that the uh, transition could be eased, and that would be to integrate first and second year residents into the clinic from the outset. And uh, when I was a resident, um, I followed um, a number, not every single patient I discharged uh, from inpatient, but I picked up a, a cadre of patients that I began to follow from my first year. And I think that it does a lot of things. You get to see patients when they're really better, not with just when they're dischargeable. Um, you can appreciate the differences in what the goals are for outpatient care versus inpatient care, and you get exposure to the clinic uh, before two years have passed, uh, you know, I would suggest that maybe first-year residents uh, might buddy up with a clinic resident uh, because they're going to be off on neurology and peds some of the time, uh, and maybe they, you know, they could do that. They could sit in on essentially be an observer um, in the clinic and begin to see the process that way. The second-year residents already have a clinic but they're only doing psychotherapy. And I don't see why we shouldn't be starting the outpatient medication management in the second year and having you know, patients following some of the patients, preferably ones that they've seen on inpatient. They know them, uh, they could be selected and wouldn't, give, uh, wouldn't have the most complicated patients there, but that would give a transition. And then another way that, that the integration of residents across classes could happen um, has been going on on 22 with professors rounds where we've had Dr. Cruz and uh, some of the senior residents who are interested or maybe doing an elective at the time on the inpatient service come and we're doing a case conference uh, there every week and uh, uh, Matt in particular has been very active and participating in that um, it, and that provides another way for, for residents to uh, to uh, interact and to discuss cases from different perspectives. Um, uh, I also used to do schizophrenia conference where we would bring in patients to a PGY 3-4 conference and the ones and twos that were available uh, could come and observe and I or another faculty or senior resident might interview the, the patient and we would be discussing that case. So there's a lot of ways that they, I, obviously, they all involve, you know, taking time and effort, but I think those really can be uh, really valuable. Lots of innovative ideas to consider. Thank you. Other ideas or questions? Any second years in the room going to carry the banner? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Food for thought. Do you want to comment, Katie? So I'm a, this is my first day of second year. <laughs> it's already, already taking projects on. Um, so I just, as a, a first year who they're referring to in this, this conference was so instrumental in helping me, one, get to know the PGY3s. And I think, you know, my communication with them really, really improved throughout my year as I got to know them, as I felt comfortable um, sending them a text or an ethic message, um, and really kind of understood the process of how we communicate with the outpatient providers um, when we have one of their patients as an inpatient. So, uh, you know, I think this is something that definitely needs to continue, and I will do my best, and I know that my colleagues will as well to, to keep this going. So thank you guys for doing this. All right, anything else? We'll call it there then. Thank you. You have been